Um, so hi everyone, um, and look, thank you very much for, um, for tuning in. Uh, I think it's safe to say that 2020 has so far been quite a strange um, and certainly a very challenging year. So it's really lovely to have the College of Law rolling out programs like this while uh, many of us are working from home. Um, and as always, I'm, I'm very appreciative for, for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Although on that note, I must say it's a little disconcerting speaking to, to what feels like an empty dining room. Um, although I do have two French Bulldogs uh, sitting over there listening very intently for now anyway. Um, so a little bit about me. I know Anthony sort of touched on this already, uh, but I began my career in private practice and made the move in-house many years ago now. Um, I, as Anthony mentioned, I, I worked at Stan, um, both as legal counsel uh, and I did a stint in the content acquisition team, which was fantastic. Um, and I'm now in the legal team at Network 10 in the programming space, uh, which I love. I am absolutely passionate about media, content, entertainment, um, and also fitness. Uh, in my, in my so-called spare time, I am a personal trainer, which certainly keeps me busy. So today I'm going to touch on sort of some of my tips and tricks, I suppose, for, for staying well, uh, physically, mentally and career-wise when we're working from home and also as many of us uh, start to transition back into the office. Um, and I think during a time when a lot of people are feeling anxiety and uncertainty just generally as well, um, although in the interest of full disclosure, in the time since COVID began and I've been working from home, um, I've had one day surgery, I've broken one tooth and I've broken one toe. So you're probably all in better shape than me personally right now. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's get stuck in. So I will try and move the slides. Anthony, you might need to... Move the slides for me. Sorry, everyone. Just having... Here we go. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to start today by talking about work from home generally. Um, and I thought it would just be a good place to start uh, by running a short poll that you can all participate in. This is the first of two questions that I'll ask back to you um, during the presentation. Uh, and I just wanna get a feel for, for whether you're all finding work from home challenging um, or if, if you're all loving it. So if you could just take a moment, um, Anthony will make that poll available. All right. So I'll just end that poll now, Emma. Fantastic. Um, we've got 130 people who have voted in this poll, just to give you an idea. Yep. And let me just share those results now with you. Fantastic. Wow, okay. Um, so as I can see, some of you are uh, all absolutely thriving. You probably never want to go back to the office. Um, you know, some of you, not so much, you're finding it a little bit inconvenient. Um, and certainly, you know, work from home can lack structure uh, and it can induce a little bit of cabin fever, um, but it can also be exceptionally productive when approached in the right way. Um, you know, and I think the reality is going forward, we will see remote working and flexible working take a much more prominent role in the legal profession. Uh, so I think it's really important that we all uh, master the art, if you like, of working from home. Now, to kickstart this segment, I am going to run a very short uh, YouTube clip. You might wonder why it's relevant, but uh, bear with me on that one <laughs> and sit back and enjoy. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, so uh, I'm sure you all got the general gist there, especially uh, the tennis lovers out there. Uh, so that was Novak, Novak Djokovic, uh, sort of taking the mickey out of the, the pre-serve routines of some other successful tennis players. Now, while we might all have a bit of a laugh at these so-called quirks, uh, there is a method behind the madness of what psychologists call the pre-performance routine that athletes have. Um, and, you know, another great example of pre-performance routine is Michael Phelps, you know, world champion swimmer, um, has a very precise routine on every race day. He wakes up at the exact same time, he eats the exact same 8,000 calorie breakfast um, and performs the same sequence of stretches in the exact same order, a very precise number of minutes before the starting gun goes. You know, so, so routine is obviously critical to athletic performance. Um, but it isn't just exclusive to athletes. You know, I'm sure you've all heard uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, wakes up at the same time every day and, and wears the exact same outfit every day. Um, so does Barack Obama. So does Steve Jobs. So does Richard Branson. And uh, why, you might ask? Let's try and... They understand that as humans, our mental energy each day is finite, you know, and they don't want to use up that precious energy on making all of these small, kind of what I call micro decisions. Now, this is avoiding what psychologists call decision fatigue. So perhaps the most uh, compelling real world study that was done into decision fatigue was actually done on judges. Um, so the study examined a panel of judges who were sitting for the day considering parole applications. And it found that judges were significantly more likely in the morning to grant parole uh, than they were in the afternoon sitting. Like I'm talking about a 70% swing here, even among very similar cases. So what the study found was that when judges were running low on mental energy, you know, after they'd had a, a whole morning of intense decision making, they naturally reverted in the afternoon to making the safer choice. So how can we all avoid decision fatigue? Um, you know, considering the average Australian adult makes around 35,000 decisions per day. And research is suggesting that we're making even more than that during lockdown, uh, given that our usual routines are thrown out the window. You know, and of course, we don't all have teams of professionals like say Michael Phelps would you know, mapping out our optimal daily routines, work, kids, last minute meetings, um, in my case, you know, the perils of courting live tele television. Us mere mortals have a lot of variables to contend with, but it's important to exert as much control as possible over those variables, particularly when working from home, to minimise all of those small, almost undetectable decisions you're forced to make each day. You know, what to wear, what to eat, uh, when to wake up, when to exercise, uh, the latte or the cappuccino. Um, you really need to automate as much as possible in your day-to-day -day life. And for example, you're probably already doing a lot of this uh, without even thinking about it. If you're anything like me, for example, you might uh, clean your teeth in the exact same configuration every day. Um, and that's a form of automation. So the easiest way to automate more decisions in your day-to-day -day and avoid this decision fatigue to save your mental energy uh, for more important things is to embrace really healthy habitual behaviours. So what are some of the best sort of habits, I suppose, uh, that we can adopt to carve out a successful work from home routine? Here are some of my suggestions. Number one, you know, optimise your circadian rhythm, which is your internal body clock, as much as possible by getting up at the same time every day. Um, you know, changing your wake up and sleep times on a day-to-day -day basis can impact your cognitive performance by about 26%, which is really significant. Um, and to the extent possible, uh, although it's not always desirable, uh, you should try and maintain your wake up routines on the weekend as well. So number two, uh, incorporate some sunshine into your morning. And I realise, you know, at least for all the Sydney siders out there, there hasn't been much sunshine in the last 24 hours. Um, but where there is, you should really try and consciously get outside in the mornings, even if it's for five or 10 minutes, 
because the vitamin D in sunshine will further help to regulate your body clock and it's gonna to lead to a better quality of sleep in the evenings, which is really critical when you're working from home. Um, look, I'm sure you all know too, it's important on that note to avoid screen time before bed um, because the blue light from your iPhones and your iPads, etc., also further confuses your body clock at a time when it should be winding down. So number three, um, look, don't work in your pajamas. So while you don't need to, to suit up to work from home, uh, and in my mind, this is one of the, the greatest perks of working from home, you do need to get yourself in the right psychological mindset. Um, you know, it's by getting showered, getting up and getting dressed in your, you know, so-called work from home uniform, whatever that might be. So number four, uh, discover your high productivity periods and leave your complex work till then. So this is a really important uh, technique to try and master where you can. Um, myself, for example, I'm much more of a morning person. Um, so, so where my you know, daily meetings allow, I try and attack my most complex work pre-lunch um, and then perhaps leave some of the less complex tasks to that post-lunch lull. And finally, um, create a permanent workspace, another really important uh, habit to, to get into the practice of. So, you know, whether you have the luxury of a, a beautiful home office or, or like me, you're set up in the dining room or at the kitchen bench, um, it's really important to work in the same place every day when you're working from home. Now, on this, uh, I should briefly touch on ergonomics. So certainly not the, uh, the most exciting topic in the world, but a really important one. So the golden rule with ergonomics, if you, if you sort of remember nothing else, is that your computer screen needs to be elevated high enough. It really needs to be elevated um, to your eye line. Now, uh, this is going to avoid repetitive strain on your back and your neck over the long term. Now, I know when, when working from home, in particular, a lot of people are working off laptops. Um, and if that's the case, if, if, if that's the situation you're in, I do highly recommend uh, investing in a standalone keyboard and mouse um, because that will give you the flexibility of, of raising your laptop screen up higher um, so you don't have that strain on your neck and your back. So I think uh, just finally on, on working from home, um, you know, work from home can offer phenomenal benefits and phenomenal flexibility. Um, and I think it's a, really, it's a really great thing that we're all moving towards. But working from home can be really invasive in your personal life, which I'm sure some of you have found already. You know, trying to get some sense of uh, work-life balance um, when work and life are happening inside the same four walls can be really challenging. So, and I, this is something I've always struggled with personally, working from home or not. Um, and so last year, I started to adopt this, this principle called the third space. Um, and the third space is, is a technique that's designed to stop you um, bringing your, your work stresses home with you. Um, and I've realized this concept is equally applicable when you're working from home. So I've just got a really short video here um, that explains third space probably much more clearly than I ever can. Um, so I'll just get that up and running for you. You got some volume there. Anthony, I think. Gosh, that's how I want to be when I get home. And I said to him, I hope you don't mind me asking, but how do you go from psycho businessman to super dad? How do you do that? And he said, well, it's all down to my third space. And I'm thinking third space. What's a third space? He said, Adam, I realise that my work has a rhythm to it. And that rhythm looks like this. He said, that's work. He said, my home life has a rhythm that's more like that. It is lower, it's more nurturing, it's more supportive. He said it's less about KPIs and P&Ls. It's not that work's bad and home's good, it's just that they are different and they require me to be different. Actually, I, um, I, I drew this graph for a, a group recently 
And I finish my presentation, I'm packing up the computer, everyone's left except for one guy. And there's a guy side of stage just waiting for me. And he comes up and he goes, what if that's home? <laughs> and that's work. He says ads, I go to work to relax. So, so we're not saying that one's good or one's bad, it's just that they are different. Now, what this CEO said, he said, the problem is I work long hours and I feel guilty about that. So I race home at the end of the day, but drag the mindset of the day home with me. He said, I walk in the door, I'm finishing my wife's sentences because she doesn't talk fast enough. I'm yelling at my kids because they're not efficient with the time that I have available to them. He said, I'm trying to run my home like I run my office. And he said, one day I opened the door of the house and as I stepped in, I saw the kids scatter. He said, I just caught a glimpse of them running around the corner of the kitchen out the backyard. He said, I came home and they ran away from me. He said, I was devastated. I walked into my room and I started to think about it. And he said, what I realized is I was like an angry hurricane. He said, I was like this angry hurricane that just tore through the house, leaving this trail of destruction behind me, criticizing my partner, yelling at the kids. He said, then I discovered a third space. And he said, this is where I changed my mindset from the busy day to a mindset that will suit my home. Now, what he did was highly impractical. He built a new entrance into his house, as you do. I looked at him and said, you did what? He said, I'll show you. Drags me back inside the house, walks me down to the garage. He says, see this door? This door goes straight to my bedroom. He said, I get out of my car. I go through the door into my bedroom. I don't talk to another member of the family. I'm off limits. I go into my room. I take off my suit. I have a shower. I put on casual clothes. He said, then I go greet the family. He said, I lose 15 minutes doesn't matter. The mindset I'm in is so important, it's worth that time. I looked at him and said, really appreciate your advice. Don't have the cash flow to build a new entrance into my home. He said, Adam, you've missed the point. He said, the third space can be anything. It's the drive home, ferry ride, bus ride, walk the dog, go to the gym. He said, it's simply a space where you think about how will I show up when I walk through that door? He said, because how all right, uh, so I hope you all uh, found that quite interesting. You know, and I think uh, although work-life separation is, is typically more easily found when we're all working at the office, mainly because you've got that physical commute to and from work, um, there's nothing stopping you, uh, like the guy they were talking about in the video, developing your own third space ritual when working from home. So, for example, um, the, the ritual I've incorporated is walking the dogs. So each evening uh, when I finish work for the day, I take the dogs around the block. And that activity signals to me, it's the end of the work day, it's time to get off the emails um, and switch into home mode so I can be present for my family. So, so look, they're my tips for uh, working from home. And I appreciate not everything will work for everyone. You know, when you look at someone like Michael Phelps and the habits he developed, for example, they were very much about performance in the immediate term. You know, he was trying to, to perform at his peak for that rate. Um, you know, legal careers, um, much more a marathon uh, than a sprint, as I'm sure you're, you all know. Um, so my advice is to identify healthy, sustainable habits that work for you. Uh, and then try and automate those as much as possible to avoid that decision fatigue. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk next uh, about relationship building. Uh, you know, we're humans uh, and we're, we're very much social creatures. Uh, even the introverts among us, which is uh, myself included, need some level of social interaction in order to thrive. You know, and yet at first glance, this new concept that we've all become accustomed to of social distancing um, and networking don't necessarily sit that comfortably together. Um, so I think to start off here, I just want to tell you a really short story um, about a young guy called Nick. Uh, so when Nick finished high school, 
he was at a bit of a loose end. Uh, so he started selling jewellery on eBay just to make a little bit of cash on the side. So he set up his little office in his bedroom and he would work late into the evening, night after night after night, selling his jewellery on eBay. So Nick's neighbour, Anthony Eisen, who you, you may be familiar with that name, you know, would spot uh, Nick's bedroom light on really into the early hours of the morning, night after night. So eventually Anthony stuck his head over the, the fence and you know, said, hey mate, what are you up to? What are you doing up there night after night? Um, so the two neighbours from that day on struck up a bit of a friendship um, and over the course of that friendship started to share different business ideas they had with each other. Uh, and then before you know it, those two neighbours went on to found the now multi-billion dollar corporation known as Afterpay. Lesson being, being stuck at home does not have to limit your networking opportunities in the slightest. In fact, your, your potential network is always much bigger and much more diverse than you might first think. Um, so of course it includes family, friends, neighbours, classmates, sporting teammates, um, your local barista. So in particular, when you're working from home, you've got more opportunity than ever before to connect with your neighbours and your local community more generally. And I think as more and more people in all professions, um, sort of start this move to work remotely on perhaps a more permanent basis, we really need to keep challenging traditional ideas of networking. So as well as looking for, for unique ways, you know, over your back fence perhaps to, to increase your, the scope of your network, um, there's never been a better time to, uh, to give some attention to your existing networks. You know, this false idea that having a strong network is about the amount of schmoozing you do or about the number of events you attend really needs to be done away with. It's not true. Um, effective networking, long-term networking, happens when you give back, when you add value, uh, and when you focus on building genuine connections with people. So my personal mantra when it comes to, to your existing relationships is just check in. You know, while we're in all, all in isolation, it's actually an ideal time to ask yourself, are there relationships that I need to reactivate that I've neglected? Um, what are the things I can start doing every day while in isolation to strengthen, reignite, you know, warm up those old relationships? So your homework, um, if you're not checking in with your network, change that today. You know, a lot of people who are in the profession or who are studying law, are feeling anxiety, chaos, job insecurity at the moment. So it's really an ideal time to reach out, give your friends and your connections a, a call, a text message, an email, check in and ask them how they're doing without expectation of anything in return. Because when COVID is over, people are truly going to remember how you made them feel during this time, you know, how you showed up when things got tough. So what is the best way to, to check in with your network? Um, look, I think number one, as always, is face-to-face. -face. Uh, so you might be suffering from what I, I started to call so-called Zoom fatigue. Um, if you're anything like me, your days are filled with an awful lot of uh, video calls. But it really is important to leverage technology when you can. Uh, you build a much deeper sense of connection with someone when you're looking at them face-to-face. You know, for example, our legal team at Network 10 um, have scheduled coffee catch-ups every second morning. So we all jump on the video chat for about 15 minutes. We talk about anything, you know, home, work, kids, the news. Um, and actually, removing the hustle and bustle of the office um, and getting a glimpse into each other's home lives, I think has strengthened our relationship in ways that would just not have been possible in the office. I think another really important technique when you are connecting with people is to try and find some common ground. Um, I think it's a really great way to take your relationships from this you know, horrid world of small talk um, and onto a more meaningful level. You know, for example, um, I catch up with one of my former colleagues every weekend for a long walk. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time and we've been great friends now for many years. Um, and our connection really only took off because we were colleagues working in the same place who discovered you know, a mutual adoration for French bulldogs. 
Um, so I, I do really recommend trying to find some common ground when you're building connections, which might have nothing to do with, with uh, your work. So I think uh, as well as face-to-face -face connection, it would be remiss of me not to mention LinkedIn. Um, you know, it is one of the world's largest online networking platforms. Um, and we're all in isolation, so there's never been a better time for, for online connection. You know, so I, I encourage you all to use the time in isolation to spring clean your profile. Um, you know, LinkedIn search algorithms actually only picks up profiles that are properly completed. Um, so it's a good thing to do. And when you do make new connections, of course, it goes without saying, don't rely on uh, LinkedIn's automatic uh, text population. Um, always personalise your messages. You know, hey, it was lovely to meet you or I found an article you might be interested in, um, et cetera. So I won't harp on about LinkedIn um, because I know everyone seems to do it to death, but um, there are some overlooked features of LinkedIn. And on this, I'd just like to run uh, the second question, poll out to the audience today. Um, so at for me, if you can make the second poll available, I would like to know how frequently do you all publish articles on LinkedIn? I'll let the poll run for another 10 seconds or so, but all, almost everybody is in, which is great. Okay, I'll close the poll. Now we've got almost 90% of everyone. Fantastic. Voted. So let me just share those results. All right, so <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can, can you all see those results? Um, it's a whopping 82% of people never publish articles on LinkedIn, um, which is, is what I expected. And you know, I certainly fall in the, the never to occasionally category myself. Um, you know, and I think it, that just goes to show that there are some other features of LinkedIn that are really overlooked, uh, but are really effective. And content creation is one of those. You know, uh, I'm a bit of a technophobe myself um, and I, the LinkedIn platform is so simple when it comes to, to publishing um, that even I was able to navigate, navigate that. And it really is an ideal platform, you know, to publish articles or blog posts that you've written. Not only does that sort of, I guess, uh, put your name out there into the, the webosphere a little bit more, um, but it actually provides a really great opportunity to connect with other publishers, particularly publishers of like-minded material. Um, you know, so that is something I encourage you all to do, particularly while you're in ISO and you might be, have a few more down hours around the house. Um, you know, have a go at, uh, at publishing on LinkedIn. Um, I highly recommend it. So I think though, um, above all, just to sum up, and I think we've skipped ahead a slide here, so ignore that for the moment. Uh, but I think to, to sum up on relationship building when you're in isolation, I think at the moment, networking is, is really stripped back to basics and it's about being human and being kind. Um, you know, because as a population, actually as a global population, we're all going through um, a collective, really challenging time. You know, and people will be dealing with that in all different ways. Um, some people will be particularly uh, stressed and anxious and isolated, uh, lonely, and that's okay. Um, but that, you know, provides a perfect opportunity uh, for you all to give back to your network. You know, reach out, um, connect with your local community, um, let everyone know that you're here and you're thinking of them uh, in a genuine and meaningful way. Because I do think how you treat your network today um, will really determine in large part how your network looks when COVID is over. <clears throat> so I'm going to, uh, on that note, move on to my third and final topic of the day, uh, which is health and fitness. So uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a, a personal trainer on the side. Um, so health and fitness is a topic that I'm absolutely passionate about. Um, despite some of you may have 
plopped up that there's a wine cabinet behind me. Um, but that aside, I am very passionate about health and nutrition. Um, and I think by now, you know, most people really appreciate the, the important link between physical health, cognitive performance, um, and your mood and your mental health. Um, and in the middle of a global pandemic, I think it's never been more important to stay fit um, and in particular to keep your immune system strong, you know. But with gyms closed, at least for the time being, um, you know, your usual routines out the window, kids perhaps running around the house more than they usually would be, you might be finding it difficult to get some structured exercise into your day, which is, I think, a very smooth segue to talk about the, the man that's currently on your screen, which is Nelson Mandela. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous lawyers in the world, really, uh, among many other things that he did. So Mandela was imprisoned for 27 years, uh, which is an awfully long time. And each day during his 27 years in prison, Mandela would wake himself up at 5 a.m. and perform an exercise routine. His routine would start with 45 minutes of running on the spot. Now, bear in mind, this was in a dark, a very damp, two meter squared cell, not very pleasant. Uh, and Mandela would continue that regime even during periods of time he spent in, in self-isolation, in isolation rather, not self-isolation, uh, in solitary confinement. Um, and even then again, when he was released from prison, um, he continued the same exercise regime. So as you can see too, um, just from that quote that's on, on the slide, uh, Nelson Mandela has been incredibly vocal in crediting exercise for keeping him physically um, and more importantly, mentally sharp. So I suppose on one hand, if you think being uh, stuck in, in isolation during COVID is an excuse for not getting some exercise in, spare a thought for Mandela, uh, who made it happen in, in the most trying of circumstances. However, <clears throat> I can appreciate that we're not all ex-boxing champs like Mandela. I'm certainly, certainly not. Uh, so we might need a little more inspiration um, when it comes to, to planning a fitness regime. Uh, the good news, of course, as I'm sure you know, there are endless options out there for, for workouts based both online and on television. And I've included uh, a snippet of some of my favourites in the notes at the end of the slide, uh, most of which are free, available on demand and cater to all different kinds of um, physical fitness levels and likes. Um, or if you're feeling really game, I suppose I, I work at Network 10, so I would also like to mention uh, that Network 10 has made available aerobics Oz style on template, if you're feeling really game. Um, so if you're over about the age of probably 30 or so, you'll probably remember that fabulous era uh, in the 90s of the scrunchy socks and the fluoro lycra and the sweatbands, etc. So if that's what you're into, look, it is a lot of fun. They're great workouts to give, give a try. Um, look, whatever you're into, uh, my golden rule, if you're starting out with fitness um, or if you're just trying to get back on the wagon, is to keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate matters. If you're really pressed for time while you're working from home, um, I, I think number three thing, three things to focus on. Number one, um, walking. You know, get that step count up. It is one of the safest, most effective ways to exercise and you will generally be getting a, a nice dose of vitamin D from the sun while you're at it, which is a double win. Um, number two thing to focus on is certainly core strength um, because building up your core strength is really critical when you're spending long hours sitting at a desk um, to ward off sort of future back and neck problems. Um, and finally, um, Sorry, I've just seen a question come up there. We might address, it's a great question. We might actually address that at the end, Anthony, if you can add that to the, the list of questions. No problem. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, my final sort of uh, recommendation, if you're game, is to invest in a skipping rope. Skipping on the spot will give you certainly the biggest bang for your buck if you're short on time. Five, 10 minutes is gonna do the trick. Um, and trust me, it's going to feel a lot more a lot more difficult than it did when you were say five years old um, so look if you struggle to stay on the fitness wagon or you simply don't enjoy exercise you should start your work from home workout regime by focusing on what your key motivations for exercise are in the first place 
Um, so it might be weight loss, uh, it might be sport based, it might be about injury recovery, uh, simply having enough energy to play with your kids, um, whatever it is, they're all extrinsic motivating factors. So it's where you engage in exercise to achieve some kind of an external reward or avoid some kind of negative consequence. Um, so if you need a helping hand in this department, there are some really great motivational apps out there. One of my personal favourites is uh, the Qantas Frequent Flyer app. So I think with certain membership, um, Qantas actually rewards you with frequent flyer points for each step you clock up during the day, which is a pretty good motivator to, to keep on moving. So before too long, uh, you might find that your extrinsic motivation won't be needed anymore. You know, over time, your exercise will become as habitual as brushing your teeth. You know, you do your exercise simply because you enjoy it. As crazy as that might sound to some. And that's what we call intrinsic motivation. You know, doing something because it's personally rewarding to you. And finding your intrinsic motivation is really essential to sustaining exercise regimes in the long term. Uh, and I've got to say that, that that switch from extrinsic to intrinsic motivation is exactly what happened to me when I started my fitness journey, I suppose you'd call it. Um, you know, my love affair with exercise started in 2005. I, I had moved to London for a 12 month sort of gap year, I suppose. Um, and yes, the kilos piled on really fast. Uh, I think it's the so-called, you know, Heathrow injection, uh, and I were I fell victim to it uh, in a major way. You know, and it, well, I didn't even actually realise at the time I was having too much fun. Um, but I started sending photos home to to show the family, and my mum made a few really helpful comments that mothers do about uh, how fulsome I was looking. Uh, so I decided then and there, you know, I had about six months to get my weight under control. Um, you know, before returning to Oz and seeing everyone again. So I joined a gym and I started very small. Um, you know, at the beginning, I'd jump on the treadmill and do a couple of minutes and then I was heaving before I knew it. Uh, I was quite unfit. Um, you know, but I kept my sights firmly on my extrinsic goal of, you know, dropping some kilos before December. Uh, and by the end of about six months, I suppose, um, yes, I dropped some excess weight, which was nice, but, um, you know, without me consciously realising it, exercise for me had become habitual. I no longer needed that extrinsic goal to, to drag myself out of bed in the morning. Um, it had become as automated as getting up and, and brushing my teeth. Um, so I guess when talking about exercise, particularly when working from home, as well as looking at the structured exercise, it's probably even more important um, to look at incidental exercise and probably more practical to focus on, on incidental movement, particularly for those of you um, with young children at home. Um, and I think, you know, when we're commuting to and from the office, uh, we naturally get a lot more incidental movement into our day. I know a lot of people walk or ride their bikes to work. Um, you know, we're constantly walking to and from meetings, stuck in, in and out to get coffee, etc. And when you're based at home, your capacity for that incidental movement uh, is, is a bit more limited. So some of the different tricks that uh, I try to keep myself moving at home, where you can, um, you know, stand or, or walk around when you're taking conference calls. Um, clean the house is a big one. It's really great exercise. Uh, do the gardening if you're a bit of a green thumb. Another really wonderful way to get some incidental movement in. You know, if you've got the time, go for a walk somewhere, perhaps to buy some lunch or buy a coffee for something a little different. Uh, if you live in an apartment, always look to take the stairs rather than the lift, um, etc. You know, whatever, whatever, you, whatever works for you, uh, just remember that it's really important to take regular breaks from continuous sitting at the desk. Our bodies are not designed to sit for, for eight hours a day. Um, so if you struggle with that, perhaps, you know, set an alarm clock for say half hourly, hourly intervals as a little reminder to yourself to get up, do a stretch, maybe do a lap of the kitchen uh, and then get back into it. <clears throat> so I think <clears throat> hand in hand with movement, both sort of some form of structured exercise and incidental movement, of course, is nutrition. Um, you know, at home, some of you probably have the added benefit of being able to, to make more homemade meals than perhaps you would otherwise. Um, you know, perhaps trying recipes you haven't had time to try before. 
um, there is theoretically less temptation to hit the vending machine at 3 p.m. Although I still have some Easter eggs floating around my fridge, so they are very tempting indeed. Um, but look, if you are looking for some fresh inspiration, uh, I can highly recommend uh, this website called Monique Cormac Nutrition. And I've put the details for this in my notes as well. So Monique was a lawyer I worked with many years ago at King and Wood Mallison's. Uh, and she's gone on to become a nutritionist, um, as well as being a mother of, of a really young set of twins. Um, so between raising twins and uh, starting up a new business, she is really a time poor. Um, so her recipes are great because they take all of that into account. They're easy, they're child friendly, um, and they're really healthy. So, so that would be my tip to, to give her a, a try. So I guess just to, to sum up today, uh, so we have some time for questions at the end. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the average person spends about 90,000 hours at work during their life, which is pretty terrifying. Um, even more terrifying, you know, is that for lawyers, I suspect that number is even higher. Um, so if you want to get the most out of those 90,000 plus hours, uh, whether you're working from home or you're back in the office, here are my sort of a summary of my top five recommendations for some healthy habits to consider including in your daily life. Uh, number one, so take notes from athletes and entrepreneurs by trying to automate those small decisions in your day-to-day -day life to retain mental energy for the things that really do matter. Number two, try and find your own third space ritual or some way of drawing a clear, clearer, perhaps delineation between uh, work life and home life. Number three, uh, nurture your relationships consistently, uh, particularly at a time when everyone is struggling with COVID. Um, number four, connect with your local community, something that perhaps, um, you know, as humans, we don't do so well anymore. Um, and remember your potential network is always much more diverse than you think. Uh, and finally, you know, try and incorporate some form of movement into each day, some type of physical movement. Uh, if you need a helping hand to get started, figure out what that extrinsic motivating factor is um, and start from there. And of course, don't punish yourself. Um, you know, if you fall off the wagon, exercise is very much one step forward, two steps back. Um, so, of course, they're my top five tips, um, but you need to think about what works best for you and your circumstances. Health and wellness is very much uh, an individual pursuit. And on that, I'd just like to finish with, with a quote um, from one of the world's leading hedge fund managers, Ray Dalio, who said, choose your habits well, uh, because habit is probably the most powerful tool in your brain's toolbox. Uh, which has really been the theme underpinning uh, much of what I spoke about today. So I'd like to, to thank you all for listening and participating um, and bearing with us. This was Anthony's and myself first go at um, running all the technology for a home session. So I hope it was as seamless as possible. Um, and I really hope you all got something out of that. So I think we're opening up now to, to some questions. Is that right, Anthony? Yeah, that's right, uh, Emma. So if anybody does have any questions, please send them through. I, I noticed one that just came through earlier as we were speaking. Emma, if you wanted to speak to that real quick. Sure. Um, I'll just, is this, can I ask if you have suggestions on how to apply these strategies when you have a preschooler at home you're caring for during the day and working from home at night? So that's come from Nicole Smith. Um, first of all, Nicole, hat off to you. I don't think um, there is any right or wrong with how to manage that other than you sound like a superhuman. Um, and I'm certainly, I don't have young children running around my house, so I should preface everything I say by, uh, you know, saying if you've got kids, strap in, hold on tight and do the best you can, um, because I can't even imagine how difficult it is at the moment. Um, but look, certainly I think, uh, remember not to be too hard on yourself. You're probably not getting an awful lot of sleep in if you're, if you're looking after your child during the day um, and then working again at night. So I think sleep should always take that top priority um, above and beyond exercise or, or you know, trying to, to roll out any other strategies. Um, so if there's ever a choice, um, I would always say try and, try and fit the sleep in before anything else. Um, 
and I guess energy levels permitting during the day, um, you know, tr perhaps try and figure out some kind of realistic movement um, that you can do with your, with your child. Um, you know, even if that, I think playgrounds in many places are open again now, even if you're taking him or her to the playgrounds, you know, um, join in too, jump on the slides, jump on the swings, run around with your child. Um, you know, child's play is really the first form of exercise that any of us do, and it's anatomically where we're designed to move like that. Um, you know, so certainly take a ball to the oval, um, you know, kick a ball around with your child. I think when you are, when you are a parent, um, the best exercise you can do is really try and jump inside your child's mindset and play along with them. Um, you know, but of course, I, I appreciate that children, children are a whole new ball game. Um, you know, if you can steal 20 minutes, um, jump on one of the apps. I think I put some recommendations in my notes. Um, you know, I have a go at something there. But like I said, above all, um, may or may not be realistic, but sleep is number one. Exercise is number two would be yeah, my advice. Um, so, Emma, we do have another question from an attendee. So the mm -hmm. question is, do you have any tips for having effective time management when there's so many distractions at home? Sure. Um, look, great question. Uh, you know, I think that the, the lure of TV and social media, um, you know, and just about anything else doing the washing, any, anything like there's, there's a lot of um, forms of procrastination that you can engage in at home. Um, I try and break my work down into sort of bite-sized chunks. So I'll say, right, Emma, you've got 30 minutes and you should get this task out of the way. And then at the end of that, reward yourself. Say, you know, I'm going to walk around the block or I'm going to take, have a coffee break or, um, you know, so certainly try and break your work down into, into chunks. Um, at the end of every day, before I clock off for the day, I refresh my to-do list for the next day, which gives me um, sort of a clearer view about priorities for the next day. Of course, sometimes that's wishful thinking. Um, you know, priorities can change at the drop of a hat. Um, but yeah, certainly I think break your tasks down into achievable tasks. Um, and then reward yourself at the end of each one with a short break. I actually have a question for you, Emma. What do you think is the um, best time of day to exercise, in your opinion? Sure. Uh, great question. Um, look, I think the golden rule, first and foremost, is any time is better than no time. Um, so if you can get some form of movement in, it doesn't really matter when it is. It will be beneficial for you. Um, that being said, um, there are particular benefits that come with working out in the morning where possible. Um, you know, it does have that added impact of, I suppose, revving up your metabolism. It's kind of like warming up a car engine for the day, um, which, you know, will not only have a, a positive metabolic impact, but it will also help to sync your circadian rhythm up to, to a healthy sort of pattern, leading to better sleep at night. Um, but on that too, um, just be aware that if you exercise too late into the evening, too close to bedtime, um, that can also interfere with your sleep sometimes at a time when your body should be winding down. So I think, yeah, morning has, has particular benefits, but the golden rule is any time is better than no time. Fantastic. We have another question from an attendee. The question is, what do you think managers can learn from the fact that many of us are actually enjoying a better work-life balance, particularly no commute and taking the time to connect with people on a personal level, which, may, which we may not get to do in the office environment? So what do you think managers can learn from that? Look, I think um, absolutely managers can learn an awful lot. I think we all have. You know, I certainly was a little bit of a work-from-home sceptic, I suppose, pre-COVID. Um, and sort of subscribe to this old school view that I'm sure a lot of managers do, um, you know, that it was important to be in the office and be seen to be there and, and engage in that, you know, face-to-face -face time. Um, and I, I am converted now. I love working from home. I've stripped out, as you mentioned, the commute, you know, I've stripped out about two hours of my day when I'd usually be sitting in Sydney traffic. Um, and that time now I'm getting better sleep, I'm getting better quality family time, and I'm far more productive. Um, because I am less stressed. And as you say, touch on personal connections. I think that's, um, you know, another really helpful thing. People are going out of their way, I think, to connect with colleagues um, and to be kind and to be gentle at the moment. And I think that's really inspiring. So I would hope that managers, um, you know, for the managers out there who were perhaps work from home sceptics like myself, 
um, I hope they've seen that actually um, in the majority of cases, you can have a really happy and perhaps more productive workforce um, working from home. Um, you know, and I think too, uh, you know, particularly in our profession, um, you know, a lot of lawyers are quite well equipped to work from home. Um, so I would hazard a guess that we are, you know, performance hasn't slipped. Certainly in my case, I think I'm working harder than ever before um, and I'm more switched on than ever before. And hopefully, you know, the results will speak for themselves and managers might see the benefit in, in really encouraging flexible working going forward. Um, because as I saw from that poll at the beginning of the chat, you know, the overwhelming majority of people are loving it. And I, I for one, am not in any rush to go back to the office. So. Fantastic. I do have another question. Um, do you have a number one nutrition tip that you can uh, impart on all of us today? Sure, sure. Um, okay, my number one nutrition tip, if you get nothing else right, um, get your water intake right. That would be my main tip um, because every single function in our body and most importantly, our brain and our brain cells only function properly if they're hydrated. Um, so you will only be performing at your peak if you are sufficiently hydrated. Um, so you should be aiming for say one to two liters of water a day, depending on your body size and your physical activity. Um, and I think one tip on water consumption too, um, you know, our bodies are not designed really to guzzle water. So it's not that helpful to get to the end of the day and go, I haven't drunk much today, I'll quickly guzzle a litre. Um, it's much more effective if you can try and sit consistently throughout the day. Um, so that would be my number one nutrition tip, get hydrated. And if there are no other questions from the audience, I'll, I'll just um, ask one more if that's okay with you. We've got a couple minutes left. Of Do course. you have any tips on how to build deeper connections when networking? You mentioned a couple earlier, but what would be your biggest tip for building those type of connections? <laughs> so I think, um, you know, actually, I was, I was reading this thing the other day, which really struck a chord with me, which I, you know, you, you might find interesting. Um, you know, I think a lot of networking suffers because we get stuck in this really awful world of small talk. Um, you know, you go to events and you roll out the same couple of how are you, what do you do, how's the weather kind of questions. Um, you know, and, and no relationship's going to flourish from, you know, staying in that world of small talk. You really need to build a stronger foundation. And there is actually this journalist, and I can't recall her name, but I was reading about a project she did just the other day. Um, she was fed up with this concept of small talk. You know, as a journalist, it's her job to try and get people to connect and open up straight away. Um, so she got a video camera and embarked on this trip around the world um, and, you know, where she recorded responses from strangers. So she'd go up to strangers and ask them, if you're going to die tomorrow, what would you do today? So a very in-your-face question. Um, but it's quite amazing. This video went viral. So um, certainly I'll send it around if I can re-find it. Um, and it was quite amazing. You know, she'll be strangers in, from all walks of life around the world open up to her straight away um, with that question. And she built these really great connections and friends from all over the globe. And she's sort of coined this movement, uh, or she's called it big talk. So instead of small talk, um, you know, let's all focus on big talk to connect, which I thought was a really cool concept. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone rush out to the next CLA and ask everyone, if you're going to die tomorrow, what do you want to do today? That might not make you, um, you know, that might be a bit confronting to some people, but I think the underlying message is there. Um, you know, really try and delve a bit deeper in your questions and get to know people um, a below the surface. 